so this is the next uh, seminar. Thank you very much for coming. Our uh, today's speaker is Attila Kanji, and um, he's going to tell you a lot about what warm dense matter actually is and how to model it. So there is going to be some quantum mechanics, but only in pictures as far as I saw. Yes. And maybe one or two formulas, I'm not sure, but very little. Um, other than that, that's a very interesting state of matter. And the way they are currently modeling is, uh, of course, everything's wrong. That's why we are here. <laughs> <laughs> But starting from first principle is always uh, a good start to be right at one point. So thank you very much, Atila, for, for preparing this. And I apologize for postponing this by one hour, but we were late in the previous meeting. Well, well thank you, Michael, for the introduction. Um, so, so this talk is on uh, modeling of performance matter, as, as Michael said. Um, and the idea is here, my idea was to give you an overview of, of what I have done in the past few years in this and what the upcoming plans are. There are a few people right in the department who work on this, like Tobias and Max. Um, so I will be trying to give an overview, trying to avoid most of the math, but there will be some formulas as well. Um, so if you don't like to just ignore them, <laughs> but it, it'll some of them are necessary to explain some concepts better. And yeah, so let's let's get started. I'm hoping to talk for about 45 minutes at most one hour, and then I hope we'll, we'll have a discussion also in between. If there are urgent questions, please interrupt me. Um, so this is the outline of the talk. I'll start and I'll focus a lot a little bit, uh, well, quite a bit on the motivation of this because we have such a broad audience. I'll give uh, uh, the theoretical background for some part of the modeling activities, not for everything. And then I'll talk about three major topics. So, well, the major topic is modeling, um, well, modeling performance matter, but then the first uh, part of this talk will focus on modeling with time-dependent DFT, and I'll explain what that is. And I'll um, present three. Actually, I should use the cursor. Um, I'll present three applications of modeling with time-dependent DFT. And in the last part of the talk, um, I'll mention recent. These are not future, but more recent activities. On, on in modeling of a warm range matter or HED matter. So the, the last bit will be a bit short and will give you uh, a brief outlook on, on what is coming up. And then hopefully we'll have a discussion. So the motivation. So, right, so warm range matter or HED matter, I use those terms interchangeably, but both of them are somewhat loosely defined. Uh, HCD often refers to even higher temperatures and higher pressures than warm dense matter. But what, what is warm dense matter? What are HCD conditions? So, so it is an extreme set of matter. So warm dense matter is an extreme set of matter. It is, um, loosely speaking, um, achieved at high temperatures and high pressures. And um, the interesting thing about warm dense matter is that um, it is difficult to define, and most of our traditional standard theories break down. So how do we achieve uh, warmness matter? It is achieved by um, transferring uh, an enormous amount of energy in a very short period of time to a material. And this is done in large... And we end up, so people from external people cannot join in the Zoom. They say some moderator has to let them in. Oh, or maybe Philip has to let them in. Um, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, please, please go on. I'll, I'll go on. Okay. <laughs> so, how do we? How is this achieved? So, this is this uh, transfer of energy is achieved in large-scale experimental facilities, 
And on the plot here, I, I show a few impressive pictures of these facilities. One of them is the sea machine, which is falls under the category of pulse, pulse power um, uh, generators. And that's at the Sandia National Labs. Uh, and that is one way to deliver in, in, in a very short amount of time, which is nanoseconds in this case, a large amount of energy. Um, so basically here in this machine, they deliver in one shot of the machine, they deliver about the energy that is used in a medium-sized city into the target. Uh, another um, facility is the National Ignition Facility at the Lawrence, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. That's a, a facility based on uh, lasers. So you transfer uh, the amount of energy into a material which will be the center of this target chamber that you see here. It will be a very small object of uh, micron size and lasers are focused on this target and they deliver that amount of energy and take the target to extreme conditions, to warmest conditions. And also here, actually very close to here in Hamburg, there is the European Expel, um, where also the HCDR is involved in terms of the high def uh, facility. And that's another um, well, facility where uh, you basically create warmness conditions through lasers and probe them with these X-ray free electron lasers. So how do we better define um, what warmness matter is? And we can uh, go to plasma theory and there is something called the electron degeneracy parameter. It's often called uh, theta. And what it roughly speaking measures is the degree of uh, the importance of the Pauli exclusion principle. So with some background in quantum mechanics, it, it's, it's a quantum mechanical principle, basically. And it, it tells you the degree of um, quant the degree of the quantum nature in, in the system. So when, when this parameter is small, smaller than one, then it's, it's a quantum system. So um, in this case, the states follow the Fermi-Dirac statistics. If this parameter is larger than one, uh, loosely speaking, it's a classical system. And then there is another parameter that is often used, which is the classical plasma parameter. That, loosely speaking, me measures uh, the, um, the degree of interparticle correlations. Uh, and here, in this case, if, if this is small, it's an ideal collisionless plasma. If this parameter is greater than one, it becomes strongly coupled. And the Wormlands regime is roughly speaking, where these two parameters are of order one. And that's shown here in the lower plot. So what we plot here is the density of the material or of matter in grams per centimeter cubed. And on the y-axis, the temperature. And, and warmness matter is in this uh, circle in this ellipse here. And if you look at this closely, you see it's where, so basically it's inter at the intersection of something that is a gas, a liquid, a solid, or a plasma. And um, if you look at ornaments matter in the nature, you see that the core of the earth is close to ornaments conditions. For sure, the, the cores of uh, giant gas planets like Jupiter are in ornaments conditions. The solar core is up here. Um, and for uh, technological applications, uh, and I'll mention this on the next slide as well, we have inertial confinement fusion and inertial confinement fusion capsules, which are being heated um, to, to achieve uh, fusion in that capsule. They go through the warmness regime in, this, in the heating process. So it's, it's, uh, this warmness regime is important for um, fundamental science as well as technological applications. And that's actually uh, shown here. So why do we want to better understand performance matter? Because it um, advances fundamental science and there are a few 
applications here. The main applications are in planetary physics and stellar physics. Um, for example, one is to, under to better understand the core of the Earth, which the, where the outer core of the Earth uh, is um, is, un um, is basically a material that is liquid liquid iron or a mixture of liquid iron, and under high pressure and temperature. And basically, if we better understand how to model formless matter, we can better understand the core of the Earth. For example, the viscosity, which will have effects on, on several things in, in terms of Earth science, like the magnetic field of the Earth and so on. Another interesting application is um, planetary compositions. So we can, these are the interior of, right, matter and interior of, uh, in the interior of gas planets. And um, if we can understand how, for example, high helium, hydrogen helium mixtures behave under Romulan's conditions, we can understand how uh, the core of planets is, um, what the, the core of planets is composed of, and we can generate planetary models. And this also helps actually for um, the modeling of exoplanets and the search for exoplanets. Um, another actually application in planetary physics is uh, understanding, again, mixtures, in particular of hydrogen and helium, um, because this tells us about lum luminosities of planets. So there, there is this uh, often unexplained luminosity of gas planets like Jupiter and Saturn. And by better understanding the core of the planet, we can explain those luminosities. Um, and finally, this was what I had mentioned earlier. So this is the inertial confinement fusion application of formless matter, where this process here is uh, illustrated in a cartoon. Right? You have a heating process of this capsule. And basically, during this heating process, um, we go through the Wormelins regime. And in the, in the best case, we achieve fusion. Um, however, uh, that is a concept and this hasn't been achieved yet. So better understanding the heating process and instabilities that occur during this heating process are part of Orbanus matter research. Additionally, um, and I don't have a figure for this, um, research in Orbanus matter is also important for novel materials discovery. So you can imagine creating new states of matter, right? When you put materials under pressure and temperature, um, you can create new metastable states of matter that might have interesting properties that are maybe harder than conventional materials. And, and this, this also leads to lots of technological applications. So that's the background or the motivation why we actually, why, why, why we care about Warren's matter. Now, um, why is it challenging? That's, um, I'm trying to illustrate this here. So the main problem is what I had mentioned earlier is that our standard theories break down. So, and mainly it is because of the persistence of electron correlation and non-LTE conditions. So non-LTE means uh, non-equilibrium conditions. LTE stands for local thermal equilibrium. These are great uh, or big challenges uh, for the modeling of formless matter. And because of this, various disciplines are being applied. So we use plasma physics, atomic physics, and condensed matter physics, but none of these methods by itself works well in the entire range of formless matter. So, um, so different disciplines are at work and also different methods that uh, belong to each of these disciplines. So we have methods like magnetohydrodynamics, particle and cell, molecular dynamics, average atom models, dielectric models, DFT, time-dependent DFT, quantum Monte Carlo, what Tobias is doing. Um, so all of these are at play and these methods are all on different length and time scales. And that's illustrated here on this figure. Um, we have these um, microscopic models, I call them, but 
basically work on the length scale of nanometers and time scales of femtoseconds. So this is basically down to the dimensions of electrons and electron dynamics. Here we have methods like, well, uh, it's an old figure, so I don't have QMC on it, but there's Contour Monte Carlo, time-dependent DFT, DFT, MD, and average atom. And these are uh, the microscopic methods. And then we have actually methods from, well, plasma physics or continuum methods, such as magnetohydrodynamics and part particle and cell methods that work on the macro scale. And then uh, these are often called device scale simulations. So they work on length scales of centimeters and milliseconds. But there is this uh, gap between the models on a micro scale and those on a macro scale. And um, one of the goals is, and that's towards the end of this talk, is to actually find uh, and develop methods, modeling, numerical modeling methods that actually bridge this gap. And uh, later I'll, I'll motivate that using data from the micro scale and machine learning and molecular dynamics techniques is one, one uh, promising method or framework that would fill this gap and would connect the, the high accuracy of the micro scale with the utility of the micro scale. Okay. Um, yes, so actually I said all of that. I, sorry, I should have <laughs> gone on the slide. So basically, right, um, well, let me just give you uh, a little more uh, information here. So basically, we, there are different um, goals here. One is actually to improve our methods that we have on the micro scale. We have these methods like TDFT, DFT, MD, QMC, and average atom models, but these are um, accurate, but there's still physics that we miss. So in particular, we want to incorporate non-equilibrium phenomena into these methods. Uh, furthermore, we want to actually um, adapt to experiments, right? There are experimental techniques being developed and we basically have to find um, theoretical models or analytical ways to connect to the experimental observables. Um, and basically want to connect the microscopic methods with the device scale methods. And, and one way to connect is um, a multi-scale simulation framework. So often this is called multi-scale because you connect uh, different length and time scales. And what, as I had already mentioned, one way to do this is using machine learning methods with uh, molecular dynamics methods. So, now let's move on uh, to some theory to, to give you uh, a better insight into what methods we use. And the theoretical background will be mainly on the microscopic methods. So time-dependent DFT and DFT. So basically when we're interested in modeling um, the dynamics or the structure of um, of materials, um, right? The, the first principle way to do that is by starting in, or by going down to quantum mechanics. So here is the electronic Schrodinger equation, so the Schrodinger equation for the electrons, for the interacting electrons. And actually, um, so it's electrons, uh, and let me explain this a little bit. So we have here um, the Schrodinger equation, and here is the term called the Hamiltonian. And the simultaneous describes um, the interactions or the different terms that are at play in the system, in the system of interacting electrons. So this is this term here describes the kinetic energy of the electrons. This term here is the um, interaction between the electrons, which interact via the Coulomb um, interaction. And here we have the interaction of the electrons and the ions. Right? So we have the underlying ionic structure and the electrons that are in between. And in the end, this term here is the interaction between the 
uh, the ions themselves. And this little r are the electronic coordinates, so basically the position of each of the n e electrons in space. And the capital R is the collective way to um, represent the positions of all of the ions in space. And the ions, is, what is T again? T is the kinetic energy. So the electrons will have, because they, they move, they will have kinetic energy. And the ions have a mass M and a charge C. And the electrons in, in this set of units, we often work in atomic units, have mass one and charge one. Um, so now and then, um, and basically what we do is we work in what is called the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which means that the time scale of the electron dynamics it is much faster than the time scale of the ionic dynamics. And that's why we basically were able to separate the problem of the, the ionic problem from the electronic problem. And, and the ionic dynamics, uh, on the other hand, is, is given in this framework in, uh, in, by this Newtonian equation of motion, right? Because this is basically how the ions are accelerated. Um, and the key quantity here that connects the two equations is the potential energy surface at uh, EJBO. You see it appears here in the electronic Schrodinger equation and in the uh, Newtonian equation for the ions. This you can actually imagine as a landscape, a uh, higher dimensional landscape that um, describes the forces of, on, on the ions due to the electrons. So as the electrons, well, depending on the distribution of the electrons in space, you will have forces on the ions. And you see there's this parametric dependence on the positions of, of the ions. So when, when I basically solve these equations uh, in a coupled way, uh, you start with a given ionic configuration R, solve this equation, calculate the forces on on the ions from this equation and then move the ions around and then this will um, cause uh, again a different solution to the Schrodinger equation and you keep doing this. So now this is um, actually nice but solving the Schrodinger equation as, is, as it is written here is not possible uh, numerically for large systems. So and that's why we have to move to a method called Density functional theory, in short DFT. Is it just a computational time frame? Or is that computation? Yes. So basically, the, the, the computational cost um, is exponential with the number of um, atoms. And there are methods to solve this equation, uh, which is a quantum Monte Carlo, um, but it's very costly. So for larger systems, we, we have to find a different way to solve this equation. And, and one of these methods is DFT. Um, and here is a very brief intro to what DFT is. It's based on what is called the hohen cohn theorems. And they say there is a mapping between the external potential and the external potential is basically the positions of the ions in space and the electronic density, which is a very powerful statement. It, it says, for one, configurations of ions in space, there's only one unique density that belongs to that uh, ionic configuration. And, and the second one says you can compute the total energy of that, um, of that system just in terms of the density. And the details don't matter here. I just put them here for completeness. Um, and and even that is not a, a practical way to solve the problem. So we have to go one step further and we have to introduce something called the Kohn-Sham framework. And this is a practical way actually to solve the electronic Schrodinger equation in this DFT picture. And these are the equations. Um, and basically we have what, what, what we do here is that we, um, and that's given here, we imagine that the electrons do not interact, although we know that they interact. But we write down the set of equations that will yield the same electronic density 
of non-interacting electrons, which is identical to the density of, in the interacting system. And all of this is formally exact. We can write down the set of equations um, and solve them. And all of that actually is achieved by uh, an effective potential. And this is this term here. This is called the Kunsham potential. And this basically has the ionic configuration plus some terms. And these terms here describe the electron-electron interaction. So they basically build in into, into this non-interacting picture what the interaction is. And these, this effective potential allows us to solve the simpler set of equations instead of the Schrodinger equation. So as I said, this is formally exact, but in practice, we need approximations basically to this effective potential. And that's an, an entire field of research. Uh, and, but we have approximations that are sufficiently accurate. Um, so we have the scheme, and here is an illustration of what this is. Um, so just to, to, to recall, so this is the equation we wanted to solve, so the, the electronic Schrodinger equation. But because this is computationally too expensive, we solve this set equation here. And, and what is basically the same here is this density. And all the observables will compute in terms of this density. How, how does it work, or what does it, this look like? That's shown in this figure here. This is, um, so imagine a helium atom. Helium atom has uh, two protons, two electrons. And this is what the external potential of a helium atom, atom looks like. It's minus two over R. And in this external potential, you have two electrons. And if you solve the Schrodinger equation, and computed the density, you would get this density here. So this is what the density looks like in, in, in space, where here the zero is the center of the atom, and then as R increases, you go radially, radially up towards um, outside from the center of this atom. So this is the density you get from solving the Schrodinger equation. And if you now solve the same problem in DFT, you basically have to find the correct effective potential. And that's shown here, uh, the long dashed lines. If you now solve the simpler set of equations in this external potential, you get the same density. And that's what DFT is. So you, you, so, you solve a simpler set of equations, uh, these Kuhn-Sharm equations, in an effective potential, and you produce the same density that you would get from solving the Schrodinger equation. And in principle, it's exact, like in this little example. In practice, um, it will not be exact. It will be an approximation. So basically, solving the Schrodinger equation will yield one density, and solving the Kronsham equations will yield another density, which uh, will be very close to each other, but they will not be exact, just because we use approximations in the DFT framework. So that's, that's the logic of DFT. Um, so why, why is it, why do we do that? Because it's computationally cheaper, right? So this is the one sentence definition of DFT. It's a computationally feasible method to solve a many body system of interacting electrons in terms of functionals of the electron density. And why is it important? Because it enables vast applications of chemistry, material science, and beyond. And this is a plot of the number of kilo papers published that use DFT <laughs> <laughs> from 1995 to 2013. So basically, if you just look at the entire um, bars, this is the, the total number of papers that use DFT. Um, these two labels, PB and B3lib, are names of approximations we use for the effective potential. These are the most used approximations, but they are um, Many, there are a few other approximations that can be used, or in this case, in the analysis of the data, they couldn't figure out in the search what exact approximation they used, but they used DFT. So you see it's maybe uh, exponentially increasing. I'm not quite sure, but it's for sure increasing uh, quite fast. Um, and it's a highly, so 30,000 papers a year, probably by now it's more. Um, which also means that the people who develop functionals in DFT, 
they get cited whenever it's used. So these people have tens of thousands of uh, citations. So it's if you develop a useful um, functional, it's also good for your CV. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and then, um, so that's DFT, but then we also, um, in particular, when we look at applications in warmness matter, we're actually also interested in what happens when we perturb a system and look at the response. So we need to go uh, a bit further than in terms of the theoretical background as we have gone so far. We have to look at response properties. And that's um, given here in this cartoon. Right, so the, the question basically is, what happens if you perturb a system at a point R and time T? What is the response of it at a different point and a different time? So that's um, a question that, that goes into the framework of linear response. And this is written here basically mathematically as a, so this is the perturbation delta V. And the question is, what is the induced density Due to this perturbation. And uh, an important quantity that comes up here is the density density response function. Or, and, and this is basically used to express other uh, quantities that are often used and they will show up later, such as the dielectric function or um, the dynamical structure factor, which we basically can compute from this response function in terms of what is called the fluctuation dissipation. So keep this in mind, we will um, come back to this. There are different um, ways to compute response properties. There are different levels of approximations. There is um, something uh, very simple, which is the response of a uniform electron gas. So there, there's no ionic structure. You just have a cloud of electrons or a sea of electrons, and you ask, what happens when I perturb that? Um, but then there, are, there have been methods developed based on this. They fall under the name of local field corrections and they improve um, the electron-electron co correlations in terms of response properties. There's something called the Merman approximation that um, basically adds or improves electron-ion correlations in this framework. And there is, uh, and that's why I mentioned this, there's time-dependent DFT, which is basically a more rigorous way to include electron ion correlations into response properties. And also maybe I should mention also what, um, so Tobias developed recently is a local field correction based on these quantum Monte Carlo calculations of the interacting electron gas. So these things fall under, under this uh, category. Um, and then um, there is, there are also nonlinear response properties and we'll actually look at an example of this in a moment, which um, we can compute, again, very computationally efficiently in terms of time-dependent DFT. So that's the real-time formulation of time-dependent DFT. And don't worry about the equations, um, but this is basically roughly saying, we go one step further than what I had um, shown in the on the introduction slide to von Oppenheimer um, dynamics. So we had the Schrodinger equation and the classical dynamics for the ions. This is one step further. We do basically we solve the electron dynamics using this time-dependent DFT framework. So it's this generalization of the DFT framework to real time. So now the equations are time-dependent. And we have a time dependent density shown here. And the ion dynamics is actually done on not on the, um, well, on this classical potential energy surface that was time independent, but now it's a, it's a time dependent or a, roughly saying an average excited potential energy surface. And, and here in these uh, two simulations, you see the difference. This is what, what you would get. This is uh, basically a material, aluminum, and a hydrogen atom moving through this uh, material. This is what you would get in the um, Born-Oppenheimer framework from, from the introduction. You're basically always staying close to the electronic ground state. And that's what you see. You see here in colors are 
what you see is the electronic density. So red means high density. Um, and you see this hydrogen atom that moves through this material, but you don't see too much things happening. The electrons stay localized around the hydrogen atom in this dynamics. Whereas if you do um, what is uh, paint here, air interest time dependent DFT, you actually get um, um, excitations. You get something like a, a wake. It's a wake of electrons. Uh, it's like when you go on a surfboard on, on, the, on the ocean. It's, it's a very similar uh, picture here. Um, and you basically get uh, plasmonic, these are called plasmonic excitations. Um, so this is roughly the theory that we, that we use. And let me now move on to, to some examples. So, um, so warm dense matter modeling with time-dependent DFT with that framework I just uh, described. And the first example is stopping power. So what is, um, what is stopping power? And that, uh, so modeling of this was actually motivated by a recent experiment um, that happened in 2015. So this is all somewhat related to inertial confinement fusion. So what is shown here is um, a proton source. So they basically have a proton source that um, they create by shining laser on, in this case, a mixture of uh, deuterium and helium, and it emits alpha particles. And then they let these alpha, they focus these alpha particles on, on a target. In this case, it's beryllium. And they, um, what they do is they um, take the beryllium to warm lens conditions, again, by shining lasers on it. And there are some experimental details that we don't need to go into here, but um, they basically create warm lens conditions in beryllium and focus alpha particles into this target. And now the question is, what is the interaction between the alpha particles that go through this uh, piece of beryllium under warm lens conditions? So you're interested in the energy transfer between uh, the projectile, which is in this case uh, an alpha particle, and um, well, protons actually, not enough, and um, and the beryllium. And so there are lots of questions here. Um, and um, what is difficult is actually creating these experimental conditions. And so having theoretical support like like this here is useful for interpreting these experiments. So there is this interplay between experiment and theory. And this is actually um, what we do. So this is similar to the movie we've, we've seen earlier, but this is an actual example of stopping power. And here is a definition of what stopping power actually is. So the stopping power is um, the force um, on the projectile integrated along its path of motion. And that's what we basically simulate in time-dependent DFT. We, we take a projectile, like in this case, um, in this case, this is a, a simulation box with a hydrogen atoms, and the projectile is also a hydrogen atom. And we, we put it at a certain position in time and space, and then we give it an initial velocity in the upper uh, simulation, the, the velocity is 300 kilo electron volts. And then we let the projectile uh, let it go. And we, we basically solve the time dependent DFT equations and compute um, what the force is at each time step on this projectile. And what is shown as the, uh, in the movies here is a, basically the time dependence of the electron density. And you see that you, you get different behavior depending on the velocity of the projectile. In, in the first case, the projectile is rather slow. And you see that uh, the electrons are localized around the projectile very much. And only later, you see excitations happening in other parts of the cell. This will happen in a moment when, when it goes through it once. You see now. Um, some excitations happening and basically it's exciting the entire unit cell or the simulation cell at some point. 
Whereas if you look at um, the projectile at the higher velocity, in this case, it's 30 mega electron volts, you see, first of all, that the electron is not, since uh, the, the projectile is moving so fast, you see that it's not as, the electrons are not as localized around the projectile anymore. You see these um, tunnels of electrons going through a target, and you see that um, uh, the, the, the block of matter is actually being excited very quickly. What is the scale? Planck scales are, um, in this case, several angstroms. So, uh, okay. of the order of, in this case, maybe 20, 10 to 20 angstroms. So, the long length scale compared to the complex one other question, could it be that the application of the entire box in the bottom plot is only a finite size effect because the projectile is going through the multiple times? Yes, that's also true. So you, you have um, both things happening, but most of it what you see is a finite size effect. And so I, I didn't mention this, but uh, yes. So if you look closely, it's actually an effect that we don't want because we have these periodic boundary conditions and but the projectile is going through the simulation cell several times, so you get artificial excitations that would actually not happen if the projectile would just move. But in, a, in the real system, the projectile moves through the target once and it doesn't go. And there are no periodic boundary conditions in, in the real case. But this is one way how we achieve um, um, efficient simulations by basically limiting the simulation box and letting the projectile move the simulation box several times and if the projectile is slow enough we don't have these five side effects if it's fast like in this case it will cause some spurious uh, contributions and here is actually a workflow how we actually compute the stopping power curve so we start now when you remember the simulation this is basically um, the distance of the, the position of the projectile and the force it experiences and the different curves are projectiles at different velocities. And you see uh, right, the spikes, most of them happening around the same place. This is when the projectile is close to an atom in the simulation box, then the force goes up, you get these spikes. So what we do is we remove these spikes. Um, and then furthermore, we integrate um, we do a running integral over these curves, which gives us the electronic work plotted with respect to the projectile distance. And then we get these, these curves here, and then we basically take the slope of these curves. And that's um, what the stopping power is. So now, when, when I go back, this was, this, in this case, they all looked about the same, right? You couldn't quite tell um, the slow, projectile from a fast, apart from a fast projectile. But as you do this, uh, when you calculate the work and then compute those slopes, you can actually tell, um, you can actually evaluate the data quite well. And you see what the differences are in, in um, with respect to stopping power and projectile uh, velocity. And then what we do is we plot, so each of these slopes is one data point. And now we plot these data points here. Um, and these are two examples. Uh, one we did was lithium, and the other one is graphite at two different temperatures of the target, one EV and 10 EV. And you, let's focus on lithium for now. You see each of the slopes is one data point, and this is what you get. This is a characteristic stopping curve where you have a maximum around what is called the Bragg peak. And, and at low uh, velocities and high velocities, you have less interaction of the projectile with the target. This is what is expected uh, also from experiment. And uh, what is given here in, in gray is, is the SRIM database. This is a collection of stopping curves, uh, experimental values, but under ambient conditions. So uh, you shouldn't compare. So we're not trying to reproduce this curve. It's just as a guide to see what what under ambient conditions, the stopping power would be in lithium. And this is what it is when you increase the temperature. So um, 
similar behavior here uh, on the right hand side. Additionally, uh, here it's graphite. And again, we have a hydrogen projectile. And again, here, uh, well, additionally, what is plotted actually in purple are surrogate models. Those are average atom models that are very, um, these are very simplified models, but you can compute a stopping power with these models as well. And actually you see that in, in the case of 10, e, 10 EV, the time dependent DFT calculations agree quite well for the larger velocities with the average atom models. And that's um, one use of time dependent DFT is to benchmark those average atom models. So these time dependent DFT calculations are quite expensive. So um, generating this curve maybe was 100,000 CPU hours roughly, whereas you can run the purple curve in uh, a minute on a desktop machine. So, so for very fast, rapid uh, production level calculations, for quick diagnostics of experiments, you would use average atom. But if you wanted to be sure that you get accurate results, you could run time dependent DFT calculations to benchmark these average atom uh, results. And another. Uh, what, what are average atom models? Is it like MD? Or? No, it's even simpler. So it's basically a single atom, uh, and you solve for the structure of that atom using DFT, and you assume a coupling of the atom to an environment. And there are different ways how you would couple, couple the atom to the plasma environment in this case. And there are Depending on, that's why there are two curves, depending on how you choose the coupling, you get also slightly different results. So it's a, it's a more empirical approach, but it's, it's one of the state-of-the-art methods that is currently being used. Uh, and the whole point is to do time-dependent DFT because we know it's, it's first principles or more first principles for sure than average atom. Models. So the average atom, you have input some information about whether you're using lithium or graphite. Um, you yes, but you also do that in in DFT. You say what what kind of um, system you look at. So this is you basically specify. Uh, where does that information go? In, in in DFT, it goes into the external potential. So basically, the 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 ionic distribution, right, and the type of the ions. That's your external potential, and that's the only thing you specify in DFT or time dependent DFT. Whereas there are more assumptions if you use a model like average atom. And furthermore, what we can do in time dependent DFT are, is that we can look at uh, microscopic forces. So this is, uh, I'll, I'll, I won't go into the details of this plot, but it's just to show that we can actually look at um, the distribution, a histogram of the forces. Uh, so we can basically do right, space resolved um, calculations and, and obtain those results. So this might be interesting in terms of, again, modeling, modeling support for experiments. Um, just checking on the time because I, so I'm already quite behind in time. So let me um, go through the next two examples uh, and then the recent and future work, I will just uh, say uh, prefer on, on these. Uh, so we stay in time. So the next uh, interesting application that is often uh, relevant to experimental support is the electrical conductivity. And, and that's interesting because, so this is now related again to the response properties I had mentioned in the theoretical background. Um, right, so there are different ways you can compute this, either in terms of the framework of response theory, you can compute um, the conductivity sigma in terms of or from the dielectric function, which you get from, from the density density response. That's one way to do it. Or another way to do it is to use time dependent DFT, real time dynamics. And when you do that, you actually, you simulate Ohm's law. So what you do is you, you perturb your, your system. Again, in this case, you can imagine it's uh, aluminum, for example, in a simulation cell and you apply an external electrical field, a pulse, like a delta kick. And then you record um, what the time-dependent current is. 
after and this. What's the wave number of your extra perpetual vacuum then? Is it Q to zero? Um, what does it mean? Because, I mean, it's Q to zero. No, in this case, it's the Q to zero limit of this. So what does it mean? It means just a constant, constant, basically constant, or what? Spatially, this is constant, and in time, it's it's a delta function. Yeah, exactly. And why why does one do that? I mean, why does one consider a finite value of you? Um, you could do that, but if you are interested in the let's say in the electronic current, it this would be sufficient to get your conductivity right. You don't need the Q dependence uh, necessarily. You could resolve the Q dependence. You could do that, but um, especially if you're interested in in taking the frequency to zero limit, you could just do this. Uh, maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> that, well, I'd say that's one way to do it. You don't. You could, of so course. I'm a little confused because I mean, in principle, when you do these experiments, for example, like photon scattering or something, then you have your dynamic structure right or whatnot at finite Hume, or you have the entire Hume dependence, whereas for the connectivity, you always take the optical limit. That is true. Um, well, right. So in so in experiments, you you then take the the limit. You you value in the interpretation of the experiments. You then take the limit of q to zero, as well, I guess. And so the experiments they are not like automatically at q to zero. They are at finite q and then extrapolate. Okay, just like the normal. Yeah. So it's like I mean, you would, for example, from X-ray Thompson scattering, which is one experimental technique to probe, let's say, the dielectric function or the dynamic structure factor, you can extract the conductivity from there, yeah. and then they take the limit, uh, they measure, and then model it, and then take the limit. Um, and um, well, in, in, in modeling in time-dependent DFT, basically the, the quantity we have access to is the time-dependent current. And basically, when you take the Fourier transform of the time-dependent current, you get this relationship between the current and the electric field, and the proportionality constant is the connectivity, the frequency-dependent connectivity. And that's what, what we can do with time-dependent DFT. And that's one example. Um, and that's actually one, uh, one of the examples, um, which is actually a, a, right, an X-ray Thompson scattering experiment of aluminum uh, at this well, ambient density, but 6,000 Kelvin temperature. And, and this is what we see here. This is the, the red curve is the result of uh, time-dependent DFT, uh, the conductivity computed in time-dependent DFT. The green curve is, um, is the current state-of-the-art model, modeling uh, method. It is what is called kubo greenwood kubo greenwood formalism, which basically uses a DFT calculation uh, as a starting point and then uses the results of the DFT calculation as an input into this kubo greenwood formula. And from that, you can compute the electrical conductivity. And using time-dependent DFT is, at this point, beyond the state of the art. And that's why we compare against this at this point. And we see, actually, quite some differences. And in particular, if you look here, this is uh, basically, right, this is the negative of the inverse of the dielectric function. And this tells you about uh, plasmonic excitations. The peak is what is called the plasmon peak. And the gray curve is what you would get uh, in aluminum at ambient conditions, so room temperature. And the interesting thing here is the current state of the art model tells you that under these conditions, the, the peak, the plasmonic peak is blue shifted, whereas time dependent DFT would say it's red shifted. So it's like a, a clear, discrepancy of what, what the state-of-the-art method says with, with a new method. So this is something we, we need to investigate further, but that's one difference that you get from uh, using different methods. Um, and, well, and the last example is actually, I had mentioned this uh, before, right now, um, so this is the X-ray Thompson scattering technique. This is one of the current techniques that probes formless matter. And roughly speaking, what is happening is you have, uh, it's an inelastic scattering experiment. So you have uh, 
the swarm lens matter sample, which is opaque to optical probes. That's why we have to use X-ray lasers. And we basically shine probe this with X-ray lasers and record the, the scattering signal. And um, basically, this can also be modeled with time dependent DFT. And that's shown here. That's very similar to the calculations of the conductivity, but now here you have, uh, as Papias uh, pointed out, now the field that you apply, the perturbation is not spatially constant, but it has a spatial variation. And what you do is you, you probe your system again with this pulse, and you look at the density response. And then from the density response, you can compute the dynamical structure factor, which is directly proportional to what is measured in this experiment. So we have a very nice uh, method to compare directly to experiment. Um, let's see. Oops. And this is actually, I, I picked this uh, figure from the paper we're about to submit together. Uh, so this is work with uh, Tobias and uh, Mac, uh, I guess Max is on it and um, Kushal and Jan Vorberger uh, from HCDR. So this is actually, the black curve is the experimental uh, signal of that experiment. Um, so uh, an X-ray Thomson scattering experiment of aluminum and, uh, under 6,000 Kelvin. And here are different uh, theoretical models, methods to model this. And you see that it's very simple. This is the very simple uh, Lintard function, the response of a free electron gas gives you one uh, prediction, which is quite off from from the scattering signal, time dependent DFT is here. It's, it's, it's better, but it's still not quite good. And um, there are quite a few um, parameters here at play that might lead to time dependent DFT being not as accurate as we might have expected. And then the CSA is, is the new approximation that we are basically, that we have now developed and that we are about to submit. And um, we see that this is an improvement in terms of a local field correction in terms of this RPA. And this is quite accurate. And the next step would actually be to also to combine this ESA approximation with time dependent DFT and then we, we can hope for even higher accuracy. Um, so this is a summary of, of that first part. So, right, um, we, we basically have uh, or time-dependent DFT is one, one method for first principles modeling of warm lens phenomena, phenomena in warm lens matter. So we have all of these different kinds of response properties that we can calculate and directly um, compare it to experiment. Um, the use of this is because we can help benchmarking lower level methods like average atom models. We can validate current state-of-the-art methods like Kubel greenwood for electrical connectivities. Um, what I haven't talked about too much is actually we can produce input to other methods like magnetohydrodynamic simulations and of course we can support uh, scattering experiments, upcoming scattering experiments at Hybrid for example. Um, and because we're almost out of time I'll, I'll just mention these two upcoming uh, recent and upcoming works in, in just one sentence. And then maybe I can give another talk at some point or we can talk offline. So, so this first part was basically first principles modeling of performance matter. And it has a connection to experiment, uh, mainly to those X-ray scattering experiments. But there are many other phenomena we want to simulate, which we cannot access just on this microscopic level. So, and this is what these two other uh, points are about. So it's one is multi-scale modeling of HED matter. And this is basically, uh, well, this is a collaboration with uh, this, the LAMPS team at Sandia. LAMPS is a uh, molecular dynamics framework. And I'll just jump here now to, to the end of that. And what it is, is actually what we do is it's, it's multi-scale in the sense that we now we use DFT in this case, DFT-MD, to, to 
generate training data. Um, we also have spin attractions, but let's not talk about that now. And what we do is we basically um, generate training data that is DFT accurate. And then we use a machine learning methodology um, called FitSnap here that maps the accurate DFT data onto an interatomic uh, potential uh, or potential energy surface. And then we can uh, use the LAMS engine and run on this, um, on this machine learning potential energy surface. And basically, uh, the hope is that even under warm lens conditions, we can run DFT accurate simulations um, on the scale of molecular dynamics, which is much larger than DFT can achieve. So molecular dynamics, especially with LAMS, you can go up to nanoseconds and you can have millions of atoms in your simulation. So that, that's, that's the goal of this. And uh, the motivation is that we want to look at magnetostructural phase transitions in materials, for example, iron. Um, there might be a connection to Hybeth, but uh, this has to be explored. Um, and finally, the last one, and I'll just show this one here, is another machine learning approach. Here, the idea is to speed up DFT itself. So here we basically, again, generate data with DFT. We, we encode them in certain atomic descriptors. And we train a machine learning model on this. And the idea is that then we predict certain quantities. In this case, it's what is called the local density of states instead of the density itself. And um, then predict energies and forces. And then we can drive. Um, in this framework, molecular dynamics. And here we think we can achieve up to simulations of up to 10,000 atoms instead of currently a few thousand with DFT. Or we can generate um, training data for molecular dynamics, but at larger scales than we can do with DFT. So this is just a little sneak preview of, of two upcoming projects and maybe at some point in the future, I can talk more about this. Maybe, I mean, um, do we have to generate the sample also, I mean, the DFT sample also at 10,000 atoms, the training data? Or do we then come through the training data for smaller systems and then somehow extrapolate it? Yes, so this is currently what, uh, what we're working on is to see how far we can extrapolate from training data. The training data is on the DFT level, which is, right, maybe 256 atoms in a unit cell, maybe a bit more. Um, but um, once it's trained, you can run uh, very efficiently on larger number of atoms. The question is how accurate is that? And that's something that has to be answered. So that's not clear. And I mean, the end of the training data maybe is discrete and then it gets more and more continuous or what's the idea? Um, so the elders, right? So we, we train the elders, um, well, it's, um, in a certain sense, this will uh, predict the LDOS for a given ionic configuration. Now I can, I can say I have more atoms than I trained on, I can still predict an LDOS. The question is, uh, is that accurate or not? And we don't know if it is. Um, there's also related to this, there will be a collaboration with Nico Hoffman actually, where we will use his uh, PIN method to do something similar to solve, again, the main equations in DFT, but in a different way. That would be an alternative Our approach. The question is, what is hindering you to go to more atoms in DFT? Um, in DFT itself? It's calculation time or memory? Um, calculation time. Calculation time. Yeah, that's currently, I mean, both, but also memory increases with increasing size because we have to diagonal a bigger and bigger matrix as we increase. Um, so it's both actually. Um, yeah. And is it always a dense matrix? Um, it depends. Or sparse. It's rather sparse, I would say, than dense. And with that, I'll, I'll, I won't go into the details of this. With that, I'll um, finish. And thanks for your attention. Um,